Hello, students. Let me just show this we're working with it. We're good. This is um, lesson number six, membrane structure. Um, this was getting a little bit delayed. I have not been able to uh, sit up and record videos for the last few days or not quite a week. But we'll get you guys caught up now. So um, you had your quiz already, so this is great. So we're on track. And this is up to the 1.3 membrane structure. This is our list from the IB. As you can see here, it's not a super long list. It's a relatively short lesson. Type of member structure membranes, um, talking about phospholipids being part of bilayers and how that works, talking about different membrane proteins. We'll also be talking about cholesterol and membrane structure. Those are three things to know. Our application is talking about how um, the implication of cholesterol in membrane structure and skills drawing the Fabergé model, analysis of evidence for the different models, the basic Yale models, and the Singer and Nicholson model of membrane structure. So here we go. Here are our targets. I can analyze the structure and function of cell membranes, and I can clearly draw um, and label the fluid mosaic model of cell membranes. So the structure of membranes depends on phospholipids, in particular their polarity. So talk about which parts are polar and which parts are nonpolar. So take a minute and talk to your partner, pause the video, um, talk to the student, or even if you're by yourself, think about how that works. What about membranes do you know? Okay, well, hopefully you paused and had a thought and or had a think and had or a discussion and you have idea that membranes have, are partially polar and partially nonpolar. And it's the combination of these two polarities that creates the membrane that we see in cells. So the first model we have for cell membranes was proposed in 1935 by two scientists named Davison and Danieli. And their idea was that lipid bilayers and we're what membranes made. So bilayers, remember the prefix bi means what? Bi means two. So we have a lipid bilayer is a layer of two uh, lipids um, that are on both sides of a thin layer of, and they're we're sandwiched on both sides by uh, proteins. So that's what we call the kind of the globular protein. Um, it's a very kind of large and irregular in shape. Um, and that's called, so it's called the sandwich model. You hear the name Davis and Yelling model for the IV. But if it helps your members, you can call it the sandwich model as well. So take a look at these two pictures. What about that description of this thin lipid bilayer is covered by a protein on both sides makes isn't really possible based on these kinds of images we have here. So the membrane here kind of curving around between the two cells. We can see the membrane here, two cell membranes, different cells, and the intermembrane space and cellular space between the two cells. So Take a minute, pause it, and look at these pictures. Just think about why is that wrong? What in these images tells us that Davis and Daniele, in fact, were incorrect? Well, hope you have an idea, and we'll come back and check your idea in a second. So first things first, phospholipids are a really kind of a magical molecule that allows a lot of things in cells to work properly. And here's the generalized structure of them. So you can see the cell membrane is made of many, many of these little phospholipids. And here's one kind of zoomed in. You have the hydrophilic head. Remember, hydro means water, and philic means loving. So hydrophilic head is also, um, can also be described as polar. So that means it interacts with water because it has a charge. And the hydrophobic tails, um, hydro again means water, and phobic means afraid of or not liking. So the hydrophobic is nonpolar. So if we look at the membrane here, we can see that the polar part, the heads, are all facing out, and then um, the tails that are nonpolar are facing in. And there's two layers, then hence the term bilayer. So here is a more complete structure of a phospholipid. You can kind of see here a simpler version of it, where we can see the phosphate head in here as a negative charge that makes it polar, with the glycerol, which has the OH group, which makes it polar as well, so hydrophilic and polar and the two hydrophobic tails, which are nonpolar. These are fatty acids. We'll come back to those in topic two later. So why does a hydrophobic or nonpolar tail and a hydrophilic or polar head, why, how do they interact with water? Which one, let's talk about attractions and repulsions here. Well, Look at the diagram here, you can see that the water molecules are going to be attracted to um, the hydrophobic 
the polar head, they're going to have positive charges in the water molecules. They're going to be attracted to the head, um, and they're going to be repelling from the tail. So attraction and repulsion happening here. And this is what creates the membrane, is this difference in attractions and repulsions. So here are some lovely diagrams of these two models. Here is the davison Daniele model we talked about earlier, with protein on the outside called the sandwich model and the bilayer in between. And this is the model that was disproven based on those images we saw, electron micrograph images of cell membranes. And what we, the reason we see here is that in 1972, Singer and Nicholson, they proposed the next model here. Um, and they proposed there were proteins there, but the proteins are not covering the entire membrane. Instead, they're embedded in the membrane. So they're inserted into the bilayer and not covering the surface, as we see here. The evidence they used to do this came from microscopy, came from these electromicrograph images, and included things like that not all membranes are identical or symmetrical. So if it was a sandwich, the protein structure would hold it in place to be much more um, firm in its shape. In other words, different functions have different structures and compositions. We don't have a consistent membrane. There needs to be flexibility in the general membrane structure to allow for specialized membrane functions. And a single protein there would interfere with water movement as proteins are mostly nonpolar. So most proteins are nonpolar and that won't let water come through the membrane. But if we have parts that are just straight, um, just straight phospholipid, then the water can go through quite easily. And then proteins throughout as well. So this evidence came through based on electromicrograph images as well as from um, evidence from just observing cells. Okay, now the name for the Singer-Nicholson Nicholson model is the fluid mosaic model. And what that means is the idea is that we have a fluid that's able to bend and flex. The um, protein covered layer, the sandwich model, does not allow for that flexibility that we see in cell membranes, which is one of the first pieces of evidence to refute that model. Um, and one thing you have to do is draw this model. So here's a nice diagram showing all the basic structures. Would you take a minute to pause the video and draw the membrane? You have to draw it from memory. That's the skill from the IB. So pause the video and make a drawing. Okay, I hope you made your drawing. And you should notice here we have each phospholipid has the polar heads. Okay, the yellow heads are the polar. And two non-polar tails are fatty acids, which are the brown tails. And these are attached to a glycerol, which is a three-carbon chain. We'll talk more about those molecules in topic two later on. Um, so how does polarity impact solubility in water? Well, we know that there are weak bonds between the nonpolar tails, and this makes the membrane flexible. So we have solubility in water on um, the inside and outside of the cell are going to be mostly water. So the environment and the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm, are mostly water. And so it's important that the part of the membrane that faces them is water, is happy in water, is hydrophilic. Um, then we have the flexibility comes from the weak bonds between the nonpolar tails, um, which are avoiding water. So the middle part of the membrane here is avoiding water at all costs. Okay, here's your key ideas. Pause the video, give them a read, and if you have a question, please ask. Okay, the next part of our lesson on membrane structure. So it's cholesterol. So cholesterol is one of the components the IV wants you to know about in particular from cell membranes. So based on your reading, what role do we know cholesterol plays in membranes? Well, one thing it does really important in animal cells in particular is it reduces membrane fluidity. So membranes are still very flexible, but they need to have some structure to them. So cholesterol helps with that. It also reduces permeability, um, so help control what comes in and out of the cell. Um, and since animal cells lack a cell wall, it's particularly important. We also have in the membrane are these proteins inside. So we have integral proteins, which means they're integrated into the membrane. So you can see here this is an integral protein here as well. Okay, and these are we call amphipathic. So amphipathic means they are both polar and nonpolar. So this protein here, this part that's sticking out, that definitely part needs to be polar because it's the part sticking in the water part of the cell. And the central part here in the middle that can be nonpolar. I can put NP because I don't have enough space to write nonpolar. And so the proteins themselves have multiple polarities based on where they fit into the cell. Now, if the membrane is complete, the protein is completely immersed in the membrane, it will just be nonpolar. This, how does that help them to perform their function, do you think?
take a minute, pause the video, talk to a classmate, think about yourself, what's the answer here? Well, a big thing here is going to help them move things in and out of the cell um, as they need to. So they need to be able to interact and maintain the polarity of the membrane appropriately. So nonpolar outside, polar inside, um, so the opposite, polar outside, nonpolar inside, and the proteins have to match that to maintain the membrane structure. Then we also have what are called peripheral proteins, which are ones that are just on the outside. So you can kind of see like this part here on the outside. That's a protein of this part of that protein there. Um, these are not amphipathic, and oftentimes to help support them, they're anchored to what are called integral proteins. So again, here would be a peripheral protein anchored to an integral protein. This makes sense because a lot of them, they have to be polar because they live in the polar environment, the cytoplasm or the cellular environment. Um, and they, they can't really attach very firmly to the cell membrane because they need to embed into the they are fixed or polar, they're not going to attach. So instead, we have the um, them bending into an amphipathic um, pr uh, integral protein, which allows it to hold on and be part of that structure more completely. Here are some of the different functions of membrane proteins. So we have ones that are important for binding hormones. You can see here's a membrane protein, an integral amphipathic protein, and the receptor for epinephrine on it. We can see how cells can adhere to each other. These are two different cell membranes combining with these different proteins that help them kind of attach. A lot of enzymes we'll talk about later, especially in topic two, are actually embedded in the membrane and helps them stay localized so the reactions have to happen. Um, they can be channels for, for transport, both passive transport and active transport pumps to move things in and out of the cell. We'll talk about this a lot in topic six, as well as in topic two, and in our next lesson 1.4 and cells communicating between each other also can happen through membrane proteins. So you're going to write those down in the description of them for your notes. Okay, so again, here we are at key ideas. Go ahead and pause the video, write them down, check for understanding, ask any questions you may have. And the last thing here is the membrane bubble lab. It's the last part of the lesson. Now, you guys, I know, already did this with this guitar, which is great. So just to review, we, these bubbles are helpful to represent membranes because they have very similar structures. So we've got a bubble, a soap bubble here. It's two sets of kind of uh, membrane of soap tails, but their tails point out and in. You have air kind of in between them or water in between them. And you have the opposite in a lipid, a phospholipid bilayer. So the difference is the tails facing in versus facing out because in the soap bubble there's a little tiny bit of water trapped between the layers and in a cell it's water in the environment outside, but they have very similar properties. So this is made you guys some bubble solution and you make bubble frame and then here were the concepts to demonstrate with your bubbles. These are not all easy to do, but these are all things you can make notes of how membranes function and why they function and why their structure needs to be that way to allow them to perform those kinds of functions, okay? All right, so that was the lesson. Next lesson is subtopic 1.4. I'm gonna try and get a little ahead on these lessons for you guys um, whenever I'm feeling up to it so you're not gonna get too far, not get behind, okay? All right, well take care and happy biology.